We still have snow on the ground, but it's already time to be thinking about planting things in the garden. And because it's too early to plant things outside, it's a really good time to start some things indoors. I have a variety of flower seeds here that I'd like to plant today. And some of them I will go ahead and plant in the trays, but some of them they actually recommend planting directly out in the garden. They're just more difficult to transplant, so I'll wait until the garden soil warms up in time to plant those. One of the benefits of using this kind of tray is that I can get a lot of seeds in a small space, whereas if I was using this size tray to plant them in, it would take a lot more square footage to get them started. These are actually a fairly small seed, so I've already made little holes in the soil so I can poke the seed right into the middle of that cell. And uh, once we get the seeds in the tray, we'll want to make sure that we water this gently so that we don't wash the soil and the seed out of the tray, and then place it in a bright sunny window for those seeds to germinate. These seeds will actually be ready to transplant in about a month's time, somewhere between 28 and 38 days. So about a month from now, we will transplant them into larger containers and then continue to water them until things warm up and we can set them out after our last frost of the spring. For the University of Wyoming Extension, this has been Donna Quinn from The Ground Up. Winter might not seem like the best time of year to start talking about gardening. However, it's the perfect time of year to start planning for next year's success in your garden. When we think about planning, we really want to think about three things. We want to think about what, when, and where. What's really an important question, what plants will work in our landscape? We want to think about what zone we live in and what type of plants will work according to temperature. We want to think about what types of soils we have and we want to think about what type of water we have available for those plants. When we think about when, we simply need to look at the back of a seed packet and it'll tell us what time of year that individual plant will work in our environment. Where is really a question that the landowner needs to answer personally because they need to think about what type of plant they want in their environment. They need to think about how they want their environment to look and then how those plants will work according to how much sun they have available for those plants in different parts of their landscapes and how much water availability they have for those plants in their landscapes. So with our cold long nights, it's a perfect time of year to start looking at seed catalogs. The University of Wyoming also has a website with publications that will help answer all three of those questions, what, when, and where. This is Hudson Hill with the University of Wyoming Extension, and you're watching From the Ground Up. Today we're going to talk about seeds. Seeds are basically the dormant portion of a viable plant. If you do a lot of gardening, eventually you're going to end up with a lot of leftover seeds. And what do you do and how do you tell if those seeds are still viable? Well, there's a couple of ways to do it. The first of those is called a float method. And if you have something large like peas, you can actually drop them into some water. And if they float, those seeds are no longer viable. They're too dry to germinate. If they sink, they're probably viable and you can plant them in your garden. The other method is to take a paper towel and get it wet and then wring out the excess water so it's just damp and place 10 seeds in the fold and wrap it back up, place it into a plastic bag and put it in a warm place and generally that's on top of a refrigerator. In about a week, come back and check and see how many of those 10 seeds have germinated. If you have seven seeds that have germinated, that means that the packet is probably 70% viable. If you only end up with about 50% germinating, it's probably a good time to throw those seeds away. So if you do accumulate a lot of seed over time, it's a good idea to check the viability of them and then go ahead and use them in your garden and over time this can save you quite a bit of money. For the University of Wyoming Extension, this is Jeff Edwards from the Ground Up.
So gardeners are, are truly lucky to have such a variety and selection of different plants that we have. You know, most gardeners will come and they'll look at their selection and they'll look at them and they'll pick what plant they want from the front of the package. However, the most valuable information is probably on the back of the package. As we look at the back of the package, it will give us information about when we can plant this, when we can plant it outside. You know, there's a lot of variation in Wyoming's climate and in different parts of the state, the seed can go out at different times. The most important information might be how deep to put the seed. A really common mistake is putting the seed too deep. The seed germinates and doesn't make it out of the ground. Um, how much space the plant needs and then how long it takes, how many days it'll take to mature and, and, and make what we want that plant to make out of. So as you think about uh, planting your flower beds and your gardens, really do a little bit of research. As we look, you know, there might be a QR code on the back that we can utilize. There's information online. Um, so a little bit of investigation and study on these species might make us more successful during our growing season. So good luck. This is Hudson Hill, University of Wyoming Extension. You're watching from the ground up. Here in Wyoming, it starts getting on to fall. Uh, the days get shorter, the nights get cooler, and our yards and uh, gardens tend to green back up a little bit. And we really have the temptation to stop watering. Uh, what we'd really like to suggest in this video is not doing that. You know, uh, we do have wonderful summers, but we also have really long winters here in Wyoming. And for all of our plants, it's really beneficial not to send them into winter drought stressed. If you can imagine, our, especially our trees and shrubs have gone all summer long. Um, we've kept our lawn green, the top three or four inches of soil, but boy, we get down below that where our trees and shrubs are living and it can be pretty dry. We're looking at a really pretty little blue spruce bush here and uh, you can imagine, uh, you know, winter's coming on. It looks really nice, it's got new growth and it looks good. You can imagine how easy it would be not to water this bush. But if we water it now, send it into winter not stressed, it'll have more growth on it next year and it'll be healthier next year. In many parts of Wyoming, if it's above 45 degrees and the ground's not frozen, we probably want to water our trees. Be careful, um, if the wind's blowing, we probably don't want to be running the water in the winter time. Late fall and winter watering is a good idea for tree and shrub health. This is Hudson Hill with the University of Wyoming Extension, and you're watching from the ground up. Many of us will remember this fall because we went from pretty mild Indian summer temperatures in October to extreme winter temperatures in early November, well below zero in many communities. And we're beginning to see uh, damage to our evergreen trees, which we all think of as hardy for our region, but they can't always take extreme temperature changes because they haven't gone through the complete dormancy changeover process that quickly in the season. One of the things that we can combat um, future pest damage and the stress on the trees is to do some winter watering. We tend to promote that every year and we recommend that especially your evergreens get watered every winter. Usually we tell you to water anytime the temperatures are above 45 degrees and the wind's not blowing, which ends up being about once a month through the winter months. The tree roots are in the top 12 to 18 inches of your soil for the most part. Almost all of their roots are going to be in the top three foot of the soil. And in comparison to our lawns, their roots are only in the top six to eight inches of the soil. So we're going to be watering much deeper to keep the trees healthy than we do when we're watering our lawns. One of the things that you want to make sure that you do is to keep a garden hose handy to do this winter watering. And then every time that you water, you want to make sure that you disconnect the hose and drain it so that you don't have any hoses freezing up. For the University of Wyoming Extension, this is Donna Hoffman and you're watching From the Ground Up. Now this is an, a section of the hedge where we've got the Arthoda and uh, the Vanatulsi. This is Subabul. 
this one so babul it's a good fodder uh, tree and legume and then i want to highlight the, this uh, water harvesting uh, structure this is the second category of water harvesting structures you take a some machine or get some people to dig about 1 uh, and 1/2 feet deep and then about 2 feet wide this much space and then all the water flow of this surrounding area comes in there in the heavy rain and it sinks into the ground it rarely overflows from here so this is if you draw a couple of these uh, trenches across the land along the contours then you will find that all the water is uh, there's no question of water erosion uh, soil erosion or uh, is completely stopped come and show from this side so now you can see it's a very basic little scooping of the earth into a little hollow that's all most primitive inexpensive in fact it's healthy to do this kind of work it reduces cholesterol and blood pressure and all and then saves the water a really common question that we receive at our extension offices around the state this time of year is when should we plant our seeds if we look around we can see that it's still a little early to put seeds in the ground here but there are four things to think about when wanting to plant seeds the high tunnel like many of our other season extending devices work great on three of the four areas of germinating seed the first thing we need to worry about when we germinate seed is soil moisture we have to have enough moisture in the soil for a seed to germinate here's a meter if mother nature doesn't give it to us of course we can get enough moisture using the garden hose the three other things that we think about when germinating seeds are first the seed variety a lot of these seeds will germinate early in the year like leaf lettuce spinach kale my personal favorite is bok choy a lot of the times we might use spinach as an indicator we plant it when it germinates and grows the other plants will also work two things that we need to think of in harmony are air temperature and soil temperature These early season plants can freeze, but we need an air temperature of about 40 degrees for them to grow during the day. We take our soil thermometer here, we put it about 4 inches into the ground. We're at about 40 degrees, and that works for these early season plants. We of course need at least 33-34 degrees for these seeds to germinate. This is Hudson Hill, University of Wyoming Extension. You're watching from the ground up. I've noticed my house plant starting to show some signs of stress which includes some yellowing leaves even some leaves that are green but they should be a dark green with more vibrant colors and so the first thing I did was repot it into a bigger container but it still needs a little bit of help so that's telling me that there is also a nutrient deficiency in this plant So personally I I prefer to use slow release fertilizers in my house plants. These slow release products will feed the plants for 3 to 4 months at a time, which means we don't have to apply fertilizer uh, very often. We can also use liquid fertilizers that are lower concentrations that we feed our plants with more regularly. You won't notice the plant change in appearance overnight. It'll probably take a week or two. Some of the yellowing or dull green leaves become more of a vibrant dark green in color and the new growth that comes onto the plant will also be very vibrant and vigorous. If that doesn't solve your problem, you can always ask your plant questions at your local county extension office. This is Chris Hilger with the University of Wyoming Extension and you're watching from the ground up. Here in Wyoming 
Wyoming and across the West, our water source can be a problem to plants, especially our tropical house plants. Our municipal waters as well as rural well water can be high in salts that it accumulates from our native soils. As we water our plants with it, it accumulates in the containerized soil of our house plants. And that can cause burning to the plants to the point that it can even kill the plants uh, if we leave it in the soil for too long. Consider watering your plants with distilled water or reverse osmosis water. And this type of water does not have extra salts in it. One of the things you can do to eliminate the salt in the soil is to put that plant in a shower or a sink and run an excess amount of water through it. That will pick up the salt in the soil and drain it out or leach it out of the soil. But eventually you are going to have to repot that plant into fresh potting soil that does not have the accumulated salts in it. Gently remove the plant from the pot, but then you want to loosen as much soil from the root base as you can so that you can get as much soil out of there as possible that we're going to replace. For the University of Wyoming Extension, this has been Donna Quinn from The Ground Up. Gardening in Wyoming is a difficult task. One of the main reasons that gardening is difficult in Wyoming is because of our environment. There's some different tools that we can utilize to help us be more successful as gardeners. In the Wyoming Master Gardener Manual, it talks about minimum air and minimum soil temperature needs for individual plants. For example, a tomato plant needs an air temperature of somewhere between 50 and 55 degrees, while a pea plant, the minimum air requirement is somewhere between 38 and 42 degrees. And if we understand these air temperature requirements for plants, we can be more successful in our gardens. A tool to utilize would be an indoor-outdoor thermometer. A simple thermometer shows us the air temperature outside and when plants can grow successfully. A soil thermometer will tell us the soil's temperature and when seeds will germinate. On the University of Wyoming's website, we have different publications that will tell us what plants can be successful in different areas of Wyoming. The Wyoming Master Gardener Manual can be found in every extension office in the state of Wyoming. This is Hudson Hill, University of Wyoming Extension, and you're watching From the Ground Up. One of the most important decisions a gardener will ever make is where to locate their garden. And once you have that site selected, there's some things that you have to take into consideration. Whether the location is level, uh, the amount of sunlight that that location gets through the course of the day, and finally, what's the soil structure of that particular location. If you're not familiar with your soil type, the other thing that you probably need to do is submit a sample for analysis. And if you don't understand how to do that, please contact your local extension office. For this particular location, the things that we need to do in order to get this site prepared is we're going to have to level it out, take care of the weeds, and actually beside those things, the soil structure here is pretty good. I can get a, a shovel into the soil, get it turned over, and there's a wide variety of clods that are, that are in this soil and ready to go. The one thing that we want to avoid at any location is destroying the soil profile through recreational rototilling. Hello. Ah. Ah. <laughs> I'm Jeff Edwards, and this is the recreational rototiller for the University of Wyoming Extension from the ground up.
One of the most common questions I get in the extension office is how to deal with weeds. And there's lots of different approaches, the old-fashioned way, going out and hoeing and pulling weeds. Another option is to use a, a weed barrier, uh, which is a, a fabric material that we lay over the ground that actually just prevents the weeds from growing up through. There's different materials to use in different situations. In this case, in our high tunnel, we're growing strawberries, and so we want to use a fabric material that will allow water down through, but is strong enough to prevent weeds from growing up from the soil. The nice thing about this weed barrier is that it's going to greatly reduce the need for me to be out here spraying weeds or pulling weeds. And the other thing I've done is installed my drip irrigation system first and then covered it up with this black plastic. So it's all ready to go. The next thing, after we finish laying out this fabric, we'll cut holes where we're going to plant our strawberries, stake it down to keep the, the wind from blowing this, uh, this weed fabric away. And other than that, our strawberry plant should be happy and pretty much weed free. From the University of Wyoming Extension, this is Chris Hilgert and you're watching From the Ground Up. Houseplants are notorious for having insect pest problems. And one of the best ways to identify whether your plants are having an issue is to take a look at them and look for a substance called honeydew. And honeydew is actually a waste product from the insects feeding. Honeydew generally collects on the lower part of the plant. And what you want to do when you're looking for insect pests is start at the lower part of the plant and work up through the canopy looking for problems. It's, it's generally found as a sugary, sticky substance on the surface of the leaves. There's usually three insects that give off honeydew. Those are scale insects, aphids and white flies, and there are several ways to control them. On the previous sample, we showed you what scale insects look like, and on this plant, we're, we're trying to show you what white flies look like. But all of these pests can be extremely difficult to try to control in a household situation. So in this particular plant, we've got a, a yellow sticky card basically as a monitoring device to see what pests are actually there. But the best way to control these is by using a soapy water solution and actually spritzing it on with a spray bottle. So in the wintertime, you want to make sure that you check your plants regularly for insect problems. And if you do detect something, you want to make sure that you take action quickly. For the University of Wyoming Extension, this is Jeff Edwards from the ground up. Many of the plants that we grow in our homes are tropical plants. Because of this, many of those plants will grow bigger than our homes will allow. We're going to walk down the hall here and show you some plants that have truly outgrown the space that they have and some methods that you can use to help those plants fit within our homes. So here we have a plant that's clearly outgrown its space. So before I start pruning, I want to step back from that plant and I want to look at it and see what my goals and objectives for the plant are. In this case, I want a plant that's shorter and more compact. So anytime I'm pruning, I want to use extra sharp tools. I'll take this to the spot where I want to prune. In this case, it's right back against the trunk of the plant. If I make this cut right in front of the growing point, that plant can have the ability to grow in the direction that I want it to grow. I'm also going to work on the sides here and I'm going to cut the ones that are just growing too wide for my space. We should always remember the plants are really tolerant to pruning and we should prune often to get the plant that we want in our homes. Now that I've pruned this material off, this plant fits a lot better in its space, it's healthy, it's happy, and it's exactly what we want. This is Hudson Hill, University of Wyoming Extension. You're watching From the Ground Up.
Last week we promised we'd talk about pruning evergreen trees. And in general, evergreen trees don't need as much pruning as deciduous trees. First of all, if there's any dead, dying, or broken branches in the tree, we're going to cut those branches out. Second, um, this tree here is part of a windbreak, so we want the branches all the way to the ground, but quite often people like to cut some of those bottom branches up. When you do that, you take several years to do it, but you'll cut a whole ring of branches and slowly bring that bottom level up. Third, this is a really good example of how competing leaders are, uh, are weaker. It's actually cracking a little bit right now. I'm going to move this one out. Fourth, quite often these evergreen trees will lose their tops to insects or, or wind damage and these main branches in the middle are not taking the lead stem. This one is. This one's taller than these two that are actually further up the, the trunk than they are. So we're going to remove these in the middle so that this one over several years time can become the main leader. Although we don't prune evergreens as much as we do other trees, a little bit of pruning on occasion can certainly make them happier, healthier, and prettier in our yards. This is Hudson Hill, University of Wyoming Extension. You're watching from the ground up. One way to grow mushrooms at home is to inoculate straw or bark mulch. Uh, both growing mediums will work very well. Uh, one problem with straw that in Wyoming, the wind, uh, of course, uh, straw might blow away. So bark mulch might be a, a better choice. If you're using straw, uh, fresh straw, sweet straw is the best choice. If it's aged and starting to discolor, it's probably not as good of a, a bedding material as, as a sweet straw is, but in a pinch it'll work. Basically what you do is you spread a layer uh, a couple inches thick down on the ground, and that'll be your bedding material. Then you take your inoculum and you spread it around that bark mulch or straw. And then lastly, we cover the inoculum with another two or three inches of straw or bark mulch, depending on the material you're using. We turn the sprinklers on, water it really well, and we can expect mushrooms to start producing within the next couple of months after the inoculation. This is Chris Hilgert with the University of Wyoming Extension, and you're watching From the Ground Up. Today we're going to teach you how to grow mushrooms by inoculating tree stumps with mushroom spores. So first of all you want to use a hardwood tree species, um, cottonwoods would work great, but just avoid things like pine and spruce. The next thing we do is drill holes, several holes into the stump. Um, I drill holes on one end and several along the, the side of the stump. Once we've done that with a, a half inch drill bit, we take our inoculum, which is the fungal hyphae or the vegetative growth of the fungus, and pack it into each of those pre-drilled holes. The next step then would be to bury this stump at least six inches deep so that all of the holes are, are beneath the soil surface, but leaving the top of the stump exposed above the soil line. We do want to give it some water. Most fungi like a moist environment. They don't need sunlight, unlike most of our vegetable plants. Sunlight won't hurt them, but planting these stumps in a shady location will work just fine as well. You could expect to harvest mushrooms the second growing season following inoculation. This is Chris Hilgert with the University of Wyoming Extension, and you're watching From the Ground Up. In 
In this episode, we're going to talk about America's favorite vegetable, at least to grow in their garden, and that's the tomato. Tomatoes are going to have to be planted after the last frost. They do not tolerate frost, and they really like warm soil and air temperatures. The tomato is gardener's favorite vegetable to grow for several reasons. First off, they're just downright good to eat. They go with many different things in many different ways. There are literally hundreds of different varieties of tomatoes. There's yellow ones, there's red ones, and everything in between. It's great to can tomatoes and use them all year long. One thing to really remember about tomatoes is they're going to use a lot of water. Tomatoes need to be watered deep and they need to be watered pretty often, more often than most other things. And in many places in Wyoming, in order to get a tomato, you're going to have to either start the seed inside or buy pretty big bedding plants when you, when you go to plant your garden. When we uh, talk about how productive the tomato is, you can see here these tomato plants have cages around them. Um, these tomatoes are going to grow up and these, these cages are going to support them because there's going to be hopefully so many tomatoes on there that will need that support. Of course in my family it just hasn't been summer until we pick a, pick a tomato off the vine warm eat it like an apple with a little bit of juice running down our face. This is Hudson Hill with the University of Wyoming Extension. You're watching From the Ground Up. Traditionally, pumpkins are one of our favorite fall crops. Pumpkins are also a crop that can encourage kids to start to like gardening. But one thing to keep in mind when growing pumpkins is that here in Wyoming, we have a short growing season. So think about starting your pumpkin seeds inside um, just to get a jump on so that you can have a nice pumpkin patch towards the end of fall. There are too many varieties of pumpkins to name here now, but know that there are white, orange, striped, and even giant pumpkins that can grow well over 500 pounds that all grow well here in Wyoming. As you can see here, pumpkins take up a lot of space. So keep in mind when planning out your garden space where you want to have your pumpkins at. Beyond just making jack-o'-lanterns, you can also grow pumpkins to eat as well. If you're looking for any more information on pumpkins, contact your local Extension office. And with the University of Wyoming Extension, I'm Hannah Johnson, and you're watching From the Ground Up. For those of you that are interested in gardening, maybe for the first time or maybe trying some vegetables earlier in the year, green leafy vegetables are some that you can try and you can get them started before that first frost-free day of the year. Uh, spinach and kale are some of the most popular greens. Uh, you can also start some lettuce mixes um, and then there are several other vegetables you can start earlier in the year as well. And if you have the opportunity to grow in a high tunnel or some kind of a covered structure, you can um, push that envelope on the temperatures because the soil will warm up even before that. These tend to be plants that take a lot of nitrogen to grow them because nitrogen produces leaf and stem tissue growth. So nitrogen fertilizer in the soil is really important and you get that if you mix in um, some type of a manure and oftentimes you'll get a good source of it with compost that you've mixed into your garden soil. Since we're approaching the summer months now, um, this spinach has had enough heat on it that the flowers are beginning to bolt on it and the leaves are gotten rather large. We'd like to harvest them when the leaves are a little bit smaller. Um, they're a little more tender that way and the flavor on them is not quite as strong. The thing about these vegetables is they do really well in our cool temperatures at the beginning of our season. They begin to taper off and struggle in the heat of summer and then there's something that you can replant in the fall and enjoy a second crop of them at the end of the season. For the University of Wyoming Extension, you're watching From the Ground Up and this is Donna Quinn. One of my favorite plants to complement the garden are peppers. Peppers come in lots of different shapes and sizes. They certainly come in lots of flavors. And there should be a pepper that just about anyone can use and like. 
Peppers do well in a high organic matter soil and they love full sun. They have to be planted after the last frost but they do survive pretty well in cooler weather. And then when they really start growing is when it really gets warmed up. They tolerate heat better than almost all of our garden vegetables. They like warm temperatures enough that they do really well in, in hoop houses, greenhouses, and that type of situation where we're adding heat. There's hot peppers, there's mild peppers. You can eat them like an apple, and then there's some that, boy, you don't want to eat plain. Peppers are wonderful to use in your garden to complement your other vegetables. They grow really well and they do well in most gardens. They have all types of uses in the kitchen. You can take the hot peppers, the smaller peppers, and just pop them in a Ziploc bag, put them in the freezer. You've got them all, all winter long to use. The bigger sweet peppers, we can dice them up, put them in an old style ice cube tray with water, freeze them, and then pop them in a Ziploc bag. Anytime you're going to make fresh salts or soups, just take them out and put them in what you want to use. Of course, the best way to eat a pepper is to eat the sweet ones like an apple all summer long warm off the vine. This is Hudson Hill with the University of Wyoming Extension. You're watching from the ground up. So here it is springtime. Most gardeners love springtime. It's a favorite time of year. We get to get out and get planting. One of, the, one of the favorite things for gardeners to plant is roses. They're a perennial, they're really hardy, they come in lots of different colors, even some different shapes. So when we start thinking about planting a rose in spring, we can think about a few different things to be successful. First of all, soil. The rose loves a, a well-drained organic soil. So in the spring, we'll get those plants, we take those roots, we spread them apart, and we get them planted in a soil that is amended with organic matter and let them start putting in roots and taking off. You know, the next thing we think about with roses is water. We've got to have consistent water deep. We want to make sure we put them somewhere where we can get them consistent water. Another thing to think about is sun. They like a lot of sun. We can put them in a real nice sunny place in our yard. One of the great things about the roses, they'll blossom all season long. In order to keep them blossoming all season long, we need to think about nutrients, so fertilizer. Uh, fertilizer that's formulated for blossoming plants will certainly work. There's also fertilizers that are specifically formulated for the rose. Get out there and buy a rose for those mothers you know and help them plant it. This is Hudson Hill, University of Wyoming Extension. You're watching from the ground up. Roses are some of our favorite winter plants and they may be some of the plants that we want to put some extra effort into in making sure that they can survive our winter temperature extremes. One of the things that we can do to protect them is to use a rose cone to cover the plants through the winter months. All you really need to do is to prune off any of the branches of the rose that are going to impede putting the cone over the plant. Anything that might be dead or broken, any damage that's done this season, you can remove now. And then you want to leave most of the plant so that it's there in the springtime to have new growth coming up on it. Then you want to fill up the space in between the branches with leaves if you have extra leaves. Then you place the cone over the top of the plant and use landscaping stakes to tie down the corners of the rose cone. And in extremely windy locations, you may want to put a rock on top just to ensure that it stays in place through the winter months. This is something that you want to wait to do until we've had some of our freezing temperatures and know that we're out of our warm uh, Indian summer type temperatures in the fall. Oftentimes you do this after the Thanksgiving holiday and then you'll leave it on until things begin to warm up in the spring. Depending upon how the season goes for the winter months, usually March or April is a good time to do that. If things begin to warm up earlier, you want to keep in mind that you want it off definitely before things begin to leaf out. For the University of Wyoming Extension, I'm Donna Hoffman, and you're watching From the Ground Up. traditional favorite in many gardens for obvious reasons.
But one of the features that they have that we often don't think about when we're purchasing roses is the rose hips that they have. Roses produce a fruit just below the flower. The one over here has a bright red color. We have one back here that has a cranberry red color. And these fruits from a flower in another part of the garden have a bright orange fruit on them. They're very attractive in the winter months, especially when you have a nice coating of snow around and you get the contrast between the fruit color and the snow. These are a wonderful way to attract wildlife. The fruit actually is very high in vitamin C and many of our wildlife will feed on them through the winter months. They're also something that you can use if you know what you're doing to make a tea or jams and jellies uh, if you collect the fruits. These are actually in the same family um, as things like apples or pears. So if we cut them open, the fruit on the inside is gonna look very much like a miniature apple. So if you're interested in attracting wildlife to your garden or maybe adding another edible plant to your garden, consider choosing a rose based on the size and color of its rose hip. For the University of Wyoming Extension, I'm Donna Hoffman and you're watching From the Ground Up. Pruning fruit trees is different than any other trees. So today we're gonna show you how to prune an apple tree. This type of pruning starts when we plant the tree and has continued throughout the life of that tree. So first we want to look at, look at our young tree and we notice that we have more than one central leader. So we pick the, the best one and remove the other. And then we wanna open up the tree by selecting our most horizontal lateral branches and we, we want to choose those lateral branches in sort of layers so we'll have a lower layer down here and then we want about two to three feet in between our next layer of horizontal lateral branches so what we'll do is we'll remove branches that are growing in between those two layers lastly we want to make sure that we're leaving these two inch lateral branches on our tree because that's where we're going to see uh, flower development and fruit production. So when we're done pruning we've opened up the tree and we've also managed the height and the spread of that tree to maximize fruit production and allow us to harvest the majority of the apples off of this tree without getting up on a ladder. This is Chris Hilgert with the University of Wyoming Extension and you're watching From the Ground Up. I want to thank our sponsor Johnny Appleseed for providing these flowers. There are a variety of reasons that people may want to consider container gardening. The biggest of those is to garden in a smaller space. You could put a taller plant in the center of the pot and arrange flowers of varying heights around that to be viewed from all sides. I'm going to arrange this pot with the tallest plant in the back to be viewed just from the front. And from there I'm going to add some plants of varying sizes around the container and they're of contrasting color. You could also do monochromatic uh, color arrangements and we'll also want to start with some plants that will cascade over the front of the pot. If you have root bound plants you'll want to break up the roots a little bit before you set the plants into your pot. Then we'll want to fill in with plenty of soil around each of the individual plants once we finish filling in, we'll want to water those plants well so that they'll begin to take up water and nutrients. Another activity that you can include, especially with kids, is decorating the pots. You can get very artistic by painting designs on the pots. And if you're looking for an inexpensive container, you might consider planting things in a cardboard box and include a plastic liner. For the University of Wyoming Extension, this has been Donna Quinn from The Ground Up. You know, when I think about gardening, I think about the reasons people garden, and there are many. 
People garden for exercise, they garden because it's a hobby, but they also garden to eat. Usually we talk about gardening and, and, and landscapes in the summertime. But, you know, really for all those reasons that I think people garden for, you can get the same satisfaction gardening indoors. So one of the best opportunities that we have for gardening indoors in the wintertime is herbs. Herbs are great, they're really hardy, um, and then we get to actually use them in the kitchen when we cook. So I have a few personal favorites when it comes to herbs. Um, we like to use chives. My grandmother used to keep mint around all the time. You know, the great thing about herbs is we can experiment. It's one thing to use dried herbs in our recipes, but boy, fresh herbs just adds a whole nother flavor. So a couple things about growing herbs indoors. We don't necessarily have to baby them, but we do have to take care of them. We probably want them situated where there's lots of light. Um, you know, we do want them in a good soil. We don't want to overwater them, but we do need to take care of them. If you have questions about using herbs in the kitchen, um, or, or growing herbs, you can contact your local extension office or you can check out our, our extension website. This is Hudson Hill with the University of Wyoming Extension. You're watching from the ground up. Many gardeners may find growing culinary herbs somewhat overwhelming and they may not want to try them, but culinary herbs have been grown in gardens for centuries along with all of the fresh produce that we grow. They come from the Mediterranean region which has some of the difficult parts of their climate as we do and difficult soils as well as we do and it makes it a very similar growing area compared to ours so they would be something you could take on pretty easily in your own garden. The one thing you don't want to do is to overwater them when it comes to the end of the growing season, you can then harvest a lot of those leaves with the aromatic oils in them and plenty of flavors and either freeze them or dry them for use in the kitchen over the winter. Another great feature about growing the herbs in your own garden is the cost savings that you'll see when you go to the grocery store and look at the cost of herbs compared to growing them in your own garden. So if you wanna try some new herbs to add to your culinary garden, um, Pick some that you use regularly in, in your cooking and start out by growing some of those in your garden and add those as a fresh item into your cooking. This is Donna Hoffman with the University of Wyoming Extension and you're watching From the Ground Up. You know, chemicals are a great tool for homeowners, landowners to, to use. They can help us control weeds, control insects, might even help us fight some disease with bacteria or viruses in our plants. In short, they really help us keep our yards greener and growing better. It's really important, however, that we use our chemicals correctly. Every year in my office, I get a phone call with someone who has a problem in my yard. When I go out, they've used an indiscriminate herbicide an herbicide that kills everything, instead of just a broadleaf herbicide. A broadleaf herbicide is just one that's gonna get the dandelions and clover and those kind of things out of our lawn. So, when we start looking at chemicals, we really wanna focus on three things. First of all, we wanna be using the right equipment. Usually in our yards, we need gloves and a hat, long sleeves, um, maybe some, some glasses. We really need to read the label for that. Some other directions that we wanna follow on the label are directions that tell us how much to apply, when to apply it, and most importantly, what to apply it on. If it's a, a broadleaf herbicide, it'll work in our lawns to kill dandelions. You know, if it tells us to, that if it's a fungicide and we need to put it on these kind of plants, we need to put it in the right place. This is Hudson Hill, University of Wyoming Extension. You're watching from the ground up. All of us who were gardeners when we were younger may have gardened with our grandmothers who always told us to put rocks or clay pot shards in the bottom of the pot to improve drainage. But research has actually shown that if you have a, a shallow 
container or a shallow soil profile, you actually get less drainage. We have three different types of pots, the bulb pot, the azalea pot, and then the standard pot. These three sponges are all filled with water to the same amount. If we leave this one shallow, like this narrower pot, um, it'll hold all of the water in it. But if I tip this sponge on its side to mimic the profile of the azalea pot, you begin to get drainage because the capillaries are longer and gravitational pull will actually be greater on it, so it will drain more water out by having a longer soil profile. And if we tip the sponge on its side, the long way to mimic the standard pot, which has a longer soil profile, there's more gravitational pull on that water in this sponge, and again, you will begin to see more water drain out of this soil profile. So if we leave gravel out of the pots, we actually have a longer soil profile, which allows gravitational pull to work on the water in the soil, and you actually get better drainage by filling the pot entirely with soil rather than having something in the bottom of the pot. This is Donna Hoffman for the University of Wyoming Extension, and you're watching From the Ground Up. Besides starting plants from seeds, there's a few propagation methods you can use at home. Plants like this aloe vera that produce offshoots from the mother plant can be easily propagated by carefully removing that offshoot and repotting it into a new container. Cacti and succulents root very easily either from stem cuttings or leaf cuttings. You could pull a leaf off of this succulent stick it on top of the soil in a container and that leaf will develop roots. Or you can cut a stem off of a succulent like this and bury it in the soil. Other plants like ivy and plants with fleshy stems like this begonia will root very easily from a stem cutting that's placed in water. We just wait for those roots to develop before potting it up into a new container on a plant like this Diefenbachia that's grown too tall for its space, we can take a four to six inch stem cutting, put that stem into a container with some soil, and within a few weeks that stem will produce roots and a new plant will begin to emerge. You can use all of these propagation methods at home on your house plants. This is Chris Hilgert with the University of Wyoming Extension and you're watching From the Ground Up.